while this sermon and some of the others have not been actually series, they are in a sense that way because we're emphasizing on every topic that you must rightly divide the word of truth in order to understand it. And in that sense, of course, any sermon is in that series. But today I would like to discuss with you Christ's dwelling in the Christian's heart by faith. Christ dwelling in the Christian's heart by faith. Now the text that I'm using comes from the letter of Paul to the church in Ephesus. In Ephesians chapter 3 verse 17. Ephesians 3 verse 17. This is where he is revealing to them his prayer for them. And in that prayer for them, he prays so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. The American Standard says, by faith, the King James says. In this prayer, Paul is letting us know First of all, that if he prayed that for his brethren, then we can pray that for our brethren today. And he prayed that Christ would dwell, live in their hearts, their inward man, where their intellect and rational powers where their conscience is, where their emotions, where their will is. That's the best way to describe your inward man. We've done that many times before, and I like to call it the real you. If you want to talk about your person, that's just about the best way you can talk about it. It's not something material. It's not fleshly. And you have your own personal stamp. And when you see the beggar Lazarus go into Abraham's bosom or paradise where Christ went when he died, then they're still just as much their person outside of the fleshly body as they were when they were in it and in this world. So we ask the question, what did Paul mean when he prayed that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith? I can read that, but I've got to ask it because this is a letter written, first of all, to Christians. Now that's where this parallels what I've been saying the last few weeks. Remember, most of the letters of the New Testament were written to those who were members of the church, who were Christians. Most of those letters were not written to people trying to convince them that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God or even that God existed or the, each step in the plan of salvation. They were written to those who had believed that and had done what Paul writes in Romans 6. They had obeyed that form of doctrine from the heart. The Lord had added to the church, Acts 2, 47, Romans 6, 17, 18, and 3 and 4. We must keep that in our minds. It must be behind our study of every letter written to an individual Christian or to the church in the New Testament. Now, that does not rule out the fact, and I said this last week, that does not rule out the fact there's a lot in those letters that teach us much about becoming a Christian. But well, they weren't written to those outside of Christ. That's a very important point, right in the body of the word of truth. They were written so these Christians could grow and develop and correct things in their lives that were amiss when it came to them living the Christian life. Now, we affirm then that the Scriptures teach that Jesus dwells in our heart. I can do that from Ephesians 3.17. I did not mention how. I did not mention that it's by or through faith. And I did not mention what that means. But the Scripture says... Jesus dwells in our heart, and Paul prayed that he would. Christians, faithful. So in this study of Christ indwelling the Christians, we may be helped also, also to understand 
the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, third person of the Godhead in a Christian. Keep that in mind. So let's look at the Scriptures. Let's examine them. Let's study them. With the intent to answer the following question. What is the manner or mode of Christ indwelling each individual Christian, thus the church? Again, I don't want us to escape this. You may say I'm belaboring the point, but it's so easy to let our minds go back to something. This is written to those who heard the gospel, believed it, repented of their sins, confessed their faith in Christ, and were baptized into Christ for the remission of sins, who considered themselves members of the Lord's church because they were, and they were Christians. The apostle then addressed the letter, notice Ephesians 1.1, 1, 1, he addressed the letter to the saints. Saint meaning those sanctified, those set apart from living as the world lives. The world lives by the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. These who have done what I've said already, we all know, believe and obey the gospel from the heart, then they are set apart. They're sanctified. They're suitable for the master's service in the spiritual body of Christ, which is the church, the family of God. 1 Timothy 3 and verse 15. And when Paul wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy 3, 15, he said, If I tarry long that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. So there's a certain way to behave yourself in the family of God. Paul saw fit to say to Timothy as a preacher, you need to know that personally. You need to know that in preaching to the brethren. And it would be also a part of preaching the gospel to those outside of Christ because of conversion. When you're converted, you don't live like you used to. You live according to the will of heaven. So, the saints who are at Ephesus, notice, and all, or and those who, which would cover all, are faithful, where? In Christ Jesus, Ephesians 1.1. 1, 1. Now, Paul, by inspiration, knew he was writing part of what would be the last will and testament of Jesus Christ. And he addresses this letter not to near-do-wells and apostates in the church and not those outside the church. Look at it. The saints, those faithful in Christ Jesus. Well, Galatians 3, 26 and 27 tells us, verse 27, the doorway into Christ is for the faithful, the believing who's repented of sins, Acts 17, 30, confessed their faith in Christ, Romans 10, 10, they're baptized into Christ. There is no other doorway into Christ because it's at the point of baptism, Acts 2, verse 38, that God says in His mind, your sins are forgiven. I hold them against you no more. You rise to the watery grave of baptism, a new creature. Your sins and your iniquities are remembered no more in the mind of God because all sin ultimately is against God, thus God does the forgiving. And thus, when one obeys the gospel, the Lord adds him to the church, or her, as the case may be. And thus, the letter is written to the saints who are at Ephesus and who are faithful in Christ Jesus. Now, those are the people that Paul prayed that Jesus would indwell their hearts by faith. Well, I thought they were Christians, that they were already in Christ, that they already had believed in Christ. Well, all this means is there's something still to keep, that you still must keep doing once you're in Christ. Let me quote a scripture we all know. It fits perfectly right here. We quote it most often. That you'd be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know, your labor is not in vain. Where? Well, it's in Christ, in the Lord. It's not in vain. It's not empty or pointless in the Lord. When you do what we have written above my head here, Colossians 
when you do whatever you do by the authority of Christ, which authority is manifested only in His last will and testament, then your labor, your obedience to whatever He's authorized you to do, is not pointless. Now the world may consider it not important at all. What does the world care about our assembling on the first day of the week and the reason we assemble? What does the world care about what we're doing right now? And the other acts of worship, singing, the Lord's Supper, giving of our means. You don't care a thing in the world about that. You have to be a saint and faithful in Christ Jesus. And that implies considerable amount of learning from God's Word, and it implies conversion in the true sense of convert. A change has been made. So we need to know who he prayed for. He didn't pray for somebody outside of Christ that this might happen to them. He didn't pray for somebody like Ananias and Sapphira. Would you call them saints and faithful in Christ Jesus? No. He didn't pray this for Demas, as Paul said, who has forsaken me having loved this present world. John talked about what's meant by loving this present world. Let's go over there and read it. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. And he says, those things are going to pass away. That is the world and the lust thereof. But those who are faithful saints in Christ Jesus are living on another plane. Oh, yeah, they're the same fleshly body. If you're standing out here and somebody's baptized in the baptistry, it's the same old body that comes up that went under. It's just wet. But we know if that person's disposition of heart was what it ought to be, Romans 6, 17, 18, then when they were buried with their Lord in baptism, they knew why they were doing it, the reason they were doing it. And they knew that if that immersion in water was to be for the reason, Acts 2, 38 declares it, they must have believed in Christ, repented of their sins, and confessed their faith in Christ to be qualified scripturally to be baptized into Christ so they could be saints and faithful in Christ Jesus. When we speak to people who have sinned, our brethren who have sinned, and they continue to persist in a sin or sins, whatever it may be, remembering sins, the transgression of God's law, 1 John 3, 4. Did you can't expect them to be able to be the beneficiaries of this prayer until they follow God's second law of pardon, which is to repent of their sins, confess them, and pray God for forgiveness. Paul's prayer then had nothing to do with the erroneous denominational concept of, well, I'm a sinner. Oh, Jesus, come into my heart and save me. This is not written to those outside of Christ. This is written to those who've been saved from their alien sins, added to the church. So it can't have anything to do with that. More than one reason. One reason, denominationalism as we know it today is 1,500 years in the future from the time Paul wrote this letter. They could be thinking that way. Remember this. The letter's written to members of the church. You say, you said that over and over again. Yes, but I know how easy it is to forget. I don't care how long you study the Bible and get caught up in the way most people think all the time. But we must remember that. It's not written by those outside of Christ and in need of being saved from their alien sins. So he didn't write to non-Christians about his desire for Christ to dwell in their hearts by faith. This is written to those who are Christians. So those who had been obedient to the gospel of Christ, thereby becoming Christians, these are the ones that he's saying, I'm praying for in this case. So he's reminding these and all Christians of their obligation to let Christ dwell in their hearts. Now, I use the word let here like the Bible does. It means you have an obligation to do your part as God created you for that to happen. 
Now, how are Christians to discharge this obligation? It's done through faith. Faith comes from hearing and hearing by the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. We walk by faith and not by sight, 2 Corinthians 5, 7. That is, we walk and live and think as the New Testament of the Christ directs us. Now, watch out of all that preliminary speaking, Paul's letter to the Colossians. Because he reminds them of their Christian obligation, their obligation in the church. Keep in mind what Paul said he was doing in uh, the Ephesian letter and praying for the members, the saints, those faithful in Christ Jesus. Look at Colossians 3.16 with that in mind. Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. Let, there's that force of a commandment, let the word of Christ dwell or richly dwell within you. Now, let's put the thinking cap on. Notice what is said in our text. Paul is praying. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by or through faith. Colossians, or rather Ephesians 3, 17. Here to the Colossians, same Holy Spirit, inspiring the same apostle, writing the Lord's church in another place, fully aware of the fact that he's writing part of the New Testament, knowing it would last till the end of time, and that somebody like us will be reading it later on to learn the will of the Lord for our own lives. Let the word of Christ dwell in you, within you. But notice Paul said it's by faith that the saints and the faithful in Christ Jesus are to let Christ dwell in them. But here it says, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. Folks, you cannot let Christ dwell in your hearts by faith if you don't let the word of God richly dwell in you. Because faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God for those in the church as well as out of the church. Now let me pause here and say before we go further. The whole New Testament system that is the New Testament system, the gospel system, is designed to save us from our sins. And as we follow the teaching of the New Testament to keep us sanctified and saved so that when we die, we will eventually go to heaven. Now, it's designed to do that. But the person outside of Christ can't be told what Paul told the church at Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 17. That's a prayer for faithful members of the church. I can pray that they may be disposed to hear the Word of God and have saving faith in Christ formed in them that once that happens, that they would repent of their sins, Acts 17.30, and confess their faith in Christ, Romans 10.10, 10, and then that they might complete their obedience to the gospel by being baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. I can pray for that. But in order to be qualified so this prayer can be prayed for you, you must be a faithful member of the church. If not, words don't have any meaning. And when I read in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 17 that he prayed, Paul did, that Christ might dwell in your hearts by faith and that your hearts meant the saints in Christ Jesus and those faithful in Christ Jesus. And then I go over here to the same apostle inspired by the same Holy Spirit in the same New Testament that is given as the authority of Christ. And lo and behold, this verse precedes the one above my head, Colossians 3, 17. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Then that means there's going to have to be a lot of in-depth study to make sure that I'm doing things just what verse 17 says. Is it an accident that what we have is verse 17 follows verse 16? Whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, give you thanks to God the Father by Him. When Christians do this, and that's who He's praying for, those who are faithful, Warning them to be stronger in the faith, to face whatever this world that Satan can use in it to throw at us to get us to cease our faithfulness. When Christians do this, then certain actions by them are put into practice in their conduct.
That is, you will conduct your life in a different way. Now look what he says, and I'm not, we're not going to study all these things in detail, but take note of these. You may want to take note. When Christians do this, I said, they will engage in certain actions. When Christ dwells in their heart by faith, they will engage in certain actions they wouldn't if they were not faithful. First of all, they'll still have the same disposition that caused them to become Christians in the first place, that they'll receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save their soul. Well, they're in Christ now and living like the Bible says, but they're to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. Now watch what happens when Paul said, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. Here's the conduct. Colossians chapter 3, 16, they sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. In verse 18, wives are subject to their husbands. In verse 19, now think about that world they were living in. In verse 19, husbands will love their wives. In verse 20 of chapter 3 of Colossians, children will be obedient to their parents. In verse 21, fathers will not provoke their children. In verses 22 through 25, slaves will be obedient to their masters. And in chapter 4, verse 1, masters will treat their slaves fairly. Now you must remember there were more slaves in the Roman Empire than were free people. And among the free people, there were far less citizens of Rome that actually were like Paul with that Roman citizenship. Well, that's what he said in Colossians. When you let the word of Christ dwell in you, there are some things specifically said that you will do because you're acting by the authority of Christ, which authority, verse 17, is set out of the meaning of the words of the New Testament, rightly divided, that you study, 2 Timothy 2.15. But now, let's go back to Ephesians, keeping in mind what Paul said, to the Colossians, that when they do what he said, letting the word of Christ dwell in them richly, there will be certain actions on their part as the word of God dwells in them richly. And they're Christians too, folks. They're not outside of Christ. So here's a parallel passage. Paul explained how being filled with the Spirit, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, would produce the same actions on the part of Christians that we just read about when we read what happens when the Word of Christ dwells in you richly. Listen, they will sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, Ephesians 5, 19. Wives will be subject to their husbands, Ephesians 5, 22 through 24. Husbands will love their wives, Ephesians 5, 25 through 28. Children will be obedient to their parents, Ephesians 6, 1 through 3. Fathers will not provoke their children, Ephesians 6, 4. Slaves will be obedient to their masters, Ephesians 6, 5 through 8. Masters will treat their slaves fairly, Ephesians 6, 9. Two separate letters. Both of them written to those who are saints in Christ Jesus and are living faithful to Him. One of them says, when you let the word of Christ richly indwell you, this will be seen in your life. The other one says, when you're filled with the Spirit, the same actions will be seen in your life. I think the comparison parallel is obvious. We are filled with the Spirit, Ephesians 5, 18, meaning we have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us as the Word of Christ dwells within us, Colossians 3, 16. I don't know how you can read these letters written to those who are in Christ, who are justified by faith. Now, that's where our lesson last week connects with this one who are saints in Christ Jesus, who are children of God, who are faithfully serving God. And that's true of the church at Ephesus and church of Corinth, or rather Colossians, or any faithful congregation, even the church at Spring, or the church wherever. 
it meets and the people live. So to walk by the authority of Christ is to study the New Testament right in the Bible word truth and Christ will richly indwell us. And what will be seen in our lives? Well, here's some of them. And when he wrote to the church of Colossae, he said the same thing. That is, when he wrote the church of Ephesus, but he said spirit, when you're filled with the spirit. Let me ask you this. How can you be filled with the spirit as a child of God and not allow the word of Christ to dwell in you richly? How do you know what the spirit wants you to do as a Christian? Now somebody says, well, what all is God doing on our behalf now? We're not talking about providence. I don't know of anybody that can tell you about what all deity does on behalf of God's faithful children as he directs them in this world. I can know that he does. I don't know other than in statements from the inspired New Testament that Christ is the only mediator between God and man. It says so. Now tell me the details of Christ being the mediator on our behalf. That is what he does specifically in doing that in heaven. I know generally what it means. He pleads our case. He's been here. He's experienced our life because he's a human. Thus he can plead our case to deity because he's deity too. I understand that. What all does that mean? You don't know the details. What about the angels? Somebody tell me what the angels are doing now. Are they hiding somewhere? Well, angel means a spirit being, not a human being. A spirit being is created for the purpose of serving God. They're messengers. That's basically the meaning of the word angel. And reading through the Old Testament and New Testament, we see how they came doing the bidding of God in certain instances. I don't know what they're doing right now. Can I say right now, I know there's not an angel in this room? I can't anymore than I can say, I know there is an angel in this room. <laughs> I can tell you in a general way what the Bible says, the revelation of God concerning what angels have done. And I don't think they're on vacation right now not doing what God created them to do. But I can't tell you what they're doing. They fit into the divine scheme of things. I don't doubt they're in the providential workings of God. I don't know what the Father is doing right now. Do you? When you think of the Father, what, goes, what do you form in your mind? When you think of Jesus at the right hand of God, what do you form in your mind? I'm giving you the words of truth. What forms in your mind when you read those signs of ideas? When you think of the Holy Spirit, and Romans 8 says he makes intercession for us, even as Christ makes intercession for us, except Christ is the only mediator. There is a different intercessor and a mediator. You need to learn the difference. Holy Spirit's not a mediator. Christ is the only mediator. Well, I don't know why he does all that. That's done on my behalf in the invisible world, but it impacts me here. I don't know how he does it. One example we have is Joseph. By the way, those were written before time for our learning, Romans 15, 4. And Joseph had to wait many, many, many years and go undergo all kinds of hardship before he was raised to be second to Pharaoh in the land of Egypt. And he didn't understand until that famine came along and his brothers came at the direction of their father and all the account we know. And then he told them after he revealed himself to them, you meant to do evil to me. God worked it for good. How do you do that? How do you do it? You know the best answer I can give to that is because he's God and he knows the end from the beginning and every split second in time and space even there has your head a number and there's not a sparrow falls he didn't know. And what's he trying to say to finite weak men? Whatever is knowable I know it and I've always known it. 
You see, what we have from God is not something he invented right on the spur of the moment like a man might and then told somebody about it. What we're seeing down to the ages as you read from Genesis right on down through the Bible is the revealing of that which was already in the mind of God. It didn't come into existence. It was there because God is knowledge just like He's love. It's a part of His very nature flowing from His essence which is not beginning and ending. It's eternal. He inhabits eternity. So all of this is a revelation of what was already there and he chose to reveal it in time and space down through history until he got in the fullness of time and Christ sent, God sent forth his son and it was time for the church to be established and now we have for 2,000 years had a completed New Testament of Jesus Christ and we're told in it it will judge us in the last day and Paul prayed for the saints and the faithful in Christ Jesus so that might be richly indwelled by the word and then we see him saying the same thing when he says let the spirit of Christ dwell in but notice this has let as a free moral agent God will not do anything to save us if we won't let him that's the power he gives you and me I've often said when God said let there be light light had to come into existence it had no will it could not say no I don't want to but a man can hear the commandments of God, his creator, his savior, and by his own stubborn will says, I know exactly that came from the Bible, but it does not suit what I want nor what I like. And we're able to deceive ourselves. So it's key that we remember that Christ dwells in our hearts through faith or by faith, Ephesians 3.17. Under the new covenant, the law of God would be written on the hearts of his people. So the Hebrews writer tells us in Hebrews 8.10. Well, it won't be written on your heart if you don't get your mind in the book. It just won't. So we're to study to show ourselves approved unto God. Word when they did not be ashamed, right? The Bible word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15. That's how it gets in our inward man, our heart. So this word that's written in our hearts is the source of our own personal confidence, trust, faith, belief in God, Christ, and all things spiritual. There's the objective standard of faith for which we are ordered to contend, Jude verse 3. When you say preaching the faith, it's the same as preaching the gospel. It's the same as preaching the word. The message preached by the apostles, same message the faithful must continue to preach today and until the end of time, is the word of faith that Paul wrote about in Romans chapter 10 and verse 8. The word of faith. Why would he call it that? Or why would the Holy Spirit have him call it that? Because faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And because we walk by faith and not by sight. And because God wants us, and Paul prayed for us, that the word or that Christ might dwell in our hearts by faith. And that when we're filled with the Spirit, these changes come in our lives. How do you think the Western world changed? How do you think that finally slavery was outlawed in the Roman Empire? Did they have a revolution? Did they try to burn down Rome, furniture stores, and the Rexall drug and all that stuff? How did it happen? I want you to find Christians doing what some people say they do in the name of Christ today in the New Testament. I want you to find them doing that. And remember, we have authority for what we believe in practice, authority from Christ. They did it through years of teaching what we've been studying this morning and causing people to see the truth about the worth of mankind. Took years to do it. And I don't doubt that some today who reject God and is, are secular and who are involved in all sorts of things would not appreciate the fact that Paul said in Colossians and Ephesians that if you let Christ dwell in your hearts by faith where slavery is legal, that the masters ought to be kind to their slaves and the slaves ought to be subject to their masters. I know they don't believe that because their idea is they won't do it right now, 
burn down the whatever and tear it up. Let me tell you something, and it better sink deeply in on me, and it's not sinking in on a whole lot of people, but on everybody. The church primarily is a teaching institution. We put into practice the truths of the New Testament, and we teach others that way. And you don't get some things changed overnight. But that's the Lord's way. Not take a chopping axe and go out here and say, if you don't change right now, I'm going to whack your head right off. It's a slow thing. It doesn't work the way men like to see things work. But the church teaches people out of evil when they're converted by the gospel. And it's never going to be that people outside of Christ are going to be what they ought to be toward one another. Never. Just forget about it. They might be more in their morality sometimes, but no. The answer is in Christ. Letting the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And being filled with the Spirit by the word of God. That's the way it works. It won't work any other way. This was said to those who were already Christians and think of the society they lived in. And yet they were to be the leavening for good, the light of the world, the salt of the earth. How did they do that? By their godly living. By the very things I listed here that comes from Ephesians and Colossians. And all sorts of other things enjoined upon them. That's how it works. It's not going to work by taking a magic wand and saying, hocus pocus, flippity flam. It won't work. It takes hard work to bring your own life in subjection to Christ. But we do know that that's the way things are changed for the good. If you're not a child of God today, we beg of you to obey the gospel as we've studied it this morning. If as a child of God we've wandered from the pathway of righteousness that is the New Testament, we beg of you to repent of your sins, confess your sins, and pray to God for forgiveness. We pray with you and for you that you'll do that now while we stand and sing.